I think we can start. Today's topic is antihypertensive drugs, and uh, we treat the hypertension. So, uh, have you ever uh, seen a patient with the uh, hypertension? Yes, a lot. Where do you see them? Well, I have many family members uh, who have hypertension. So, uh, what drugs uh, do they take? No, I, I don't know. Why? I, I didn't ask, but I know that uh, they have hypertension. So, maybe after this class, you should ask all of them, so, and you can manage the treatment and check if the prescription is correct. Okay. So, uh, how, uh, how do they diagnose the uh, hypertension? Like when, when they get it? Yes, when or how do they know they are hypertensive? Um, it depends if it's high or low. If it's high, they have um, tachycardia, headache, um, well, inability to move or not to move, they feel dizzy. Uh, if, if it's low, they feel dizzy too, but um bradycardia um they they don't have headaches if it's low they just feel dizzy that, that's that's all i think okay so these these are some symptoms but most of the time uh there are no symptoms like the yes yes if if um they know right away when they get a headache or when they um, because it's a very strong headache uh, they know right away that it's their hypertension but most of the time they are fine yes and uh, moreover when the hypertension is not severe it's actually asymptomatic so that is why uh, it's hard to diagnose hypertension because uh, there, there are no symptoms. Like for other diseases, usually there is a pain or some uh, inability so that uh, the patient can report to the uh, physician. But in case of the uh, uh, hypertension, uh, the, there are no symptoms that usually it's uh, diagnosed during the routine check or, or when the patient admits to the hospital or to the physician's uh, room for other disease and then the physician routinely checks the uh, pressure uh, and that uh, that uh, this way the hypertension can be diagnosed. So any other uh, students here that are uh, seeing a hypertension or have friends or family with hypertension? Loot. Salma.
yes teacher so do you have any friends or family members with a hypertension no no so anyone else rami no we don't you don't Ahmed? No. Ahmed Salim? Yes. So, uh, what is the type of the hypertension and who, who has the hypertension? Yes. So what do you know about hypertension from these family members or who is the hypertensive? I don't know. Okay, Ahab. Ahab, do you have any um, family members with the hypertension? Mohammed, Khulud. No teacher, I don't have. You don't know? You don't know? You, I don't have any family member who have uh, hypertension. Okay. And or do you know anyone with a hypertension around you? No. No. no? So then, uh, uh, the, your homework for today will be to measure uh, uh, the, uh, the blood pressure for all your family members and report me the blood pressure of your family members, okay? Okay. For all of you, you have next, uh, next week uh, at the beginning, so at, during the class, I will ask you how do you measure the blood pressure and for what were results. Please write down the results for every member for every member of your family, and then we will select a drug for uh, every member of your family so you can uh, uh, treat the uh, hypertension. Agree. Okay. Sandy, and please uh, tell those who missed the class so they do the same. Uh, and uh, do you know how to measure the pressure, uh, the blood pressure? Yes. Yes, teacher, you learned. You learned. But teacher, how we will measure the blood pressure? Do you have a like we are here and there, there and like I I and we don't have this device at home so uh, if you are not at home if you are abroad then please mm -hmm. measure uh, uh, the blood pressure for anywhere one that is around you like if you are in a student hostel then measure it for some old person that is like sitting at the security office or somewhere or just your or roommates so anyone around okay and okay. for the tools like uh, try to find one around because the uh, the there are usually uh, free tools available uh, in pharmacies so you can uh, and also in the hospitals and polyclinics uh, some polyclinics even uh, have now automatic devices so you just put your hand 
press the button and then it will do uh, everything itself okay so how did you okay sorry i'm saying okay okay good so uh, and uh, this way you will uh, help your family and friends around to diagnose the arterial hypertension because most of the time uh, it is asymptomatic and also uh, usually so the uh, arterial hypertension also Uh, arterial, arterial, arterial hypertension also can be uh, just from the white coat like uh, because when a patient goes to the hospital uh, usually uh, he or she is very concerned about the disease because uh, because of the symptoms and uh, because they anticipate the diagnosis from the uh, physician and usually physicians like they tell that you have a disease and there are there are much there are some consequences like for example your life expectation is decreased so or the patient has to take medicines medicines are usually expensive so that is why when the patient goes to the hospital he or she is already uh, frightened the diagnosis and that itself can cause the arterial hypertension so and that is why we measured uh, in the physician's office the blood pressure is usually high but that doesn't mean that the patient has uh, arterial hypertension because uh, the increase in blood pressure during the stress is uh, physiologic so like uh, during the uh, physical exercises for example or when you have a stress uh, your heart rate is increased and that is why the uh, blood pressure increases as well uh, but this uh, increase is only uh, it's not uh, constant it is oh sorry it is the transient Sandy so if um if there is a reason behind the hypertension the person is not diagnosed with hypertension yes so uh, if uh, during the measurement uh, the patient has some troubles like uh, he or she is struggling or that diagnosis will not be uh, precise so for precise diagnosis you have to measure the uh, uh, the blood pressure during the day for several days like uh, several weeks so and like several times a week like five to six times a week uh, a day during one two weeks and then uh, you have to look for the mean uh, uh, blood pressure and uh, also for the maximum and minimum uh, and also most frequent uh, pr uh, pressure and if that mean will be higher and only then you can be diagnosed the arterial hypertension because for example uh, even the uh, completely healthy uh, patient will uh, have a, a blood pressure 160 and above uh, during the stress and that is normal because this is a physiological response so when you are 
are frightened or when you are running from so or doing some physical exercise your heart rate is increased and uh, this the same is with your blood pressure because they are connected so uh, physicians are frequently over diagnose the arterial hypertension because of that uh, because of because patients are frightened the white coat like when they see white coat they just become very concerned and stressful so this is that is why uh, the current recommendations are to measure the blood pressure at home uh, and nowadays there are uh, automatic devices for uh, blood pressure measurement uh, and so it's easier to measure at home so the patients can measure themselves so do you have automatic devices at, at home for blood pressure what, what automatic devices uh, the uh, the automatic pump for blood pressure measurement uh, we have this device um, like with a cuff which is wrapped around the arm and um, this old one I don't know if there is a new automatic device so the automatic uh, like it has a uh, uh, electric pump then you just press the button and it uh, shows you the systolic and diastolic pressure and also heart rate on the di on the display do you have this one no no, no we have the old-fashioned one so the old-fashioned like you have to pump with your hand and then uh, you have a, a pressure gauge and then you uh, you need to or put a phonendoscope and then uh, listen for the sounds. So, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I hope you know the technique. The technique is rather s simple. I think until we hear the heartbeat, this is the diastolic. This is systolic. Systolic, okay. And then after that, uh, it's the diastolic. So uh, you need to uh, to uh, to remember uh, to, to so to read the measurements twice. So first you pump the pressure uh, to the uh, to the some degree that is higher than you expect. Like for example, you expect the pressure is uh, for example 150 and then you have to pump to the 180 or even 200 so and then you start to slowly decrease the pressure and at some point you hear the tones so when they start when you start to hear the tone this is the systolic pressure and then you decrease further and when you these tones are will disappear then this is the diastolic pressure. So this is the uh, unblooded Korotkov method that was introduced in I think 50s, in 1950s by Russian physician Korotkov. So and then it was adopted throughout the world because it's uh, unbloody, so it does not require the uh, the uh, injection, so the injection of the needle to the artery. At, at, so before this method was discovered, the blood pressure measurement should be done with the it's blood it was bloody, so more uh, comprehensive.
and also when you measure the blood pressure after you measure first time so if you want to repeat you have to wait at least four hours so because during the four hours the consecutive measurements will be not accurate mm -hmm. and also patients have to to sit and stay rested so if patients were was running or doing some physical exercise you or please ask him to to stop also to to have a rest before so uh, and uh, by the way please write down the uh, the homework for the next week is diuretics so the next chapter uh, diuretics okay so have you prepared so have you read the chapter for today for antihypertension yes uh yes i, I read it right. how do you know it's antihypertensive today from the plan do you have plan okay good that's very well so uh, i hope other other students it's, also it's in the syllabus too that uh, that's on the education on the portal. Portal. Okay. yes good. Uh, so uh, usually the first class like um, most of the students are not ready so that is why okay. I don't expect it that one Sandy <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so it looks like you are very curious about the uh, subject so please continue the same way. well done <laughs> thank you uh, anyone else prepared for the class help so sandy do you have any questions like on the on, about the no i i had only one question um whether uh, if there is a reason behind the hypertension whether it's considered as hypertension or not because sometimes i feel the symptoms of hypertension and those family members tell me that this is hypertension but most of the time there is a reason uh, behind it for example, when I'm stressed or when I'm angry or um, I drank very strong coffee, <laughs> so. Uh, yes, that, that, that's true. There's like the symptoms are not enough. So uh, uh, the hypertension, so that is not constant. So that is physiology. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the coffee intake will increase the uh, the turns or turn of the vessels and this is the reason for hypertension because of the large amounts of the coffee uh, mm -hmm. and um, it was it was a very strong coffee like um it had uh, many shots of coffee uh, and just milk and sugar and after i drank it i I um I felt a very 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 strong headache and my heartbeat was very high and very loud and I felt dizzy. Mm, uh, maybe uh, this uh, some uh, so some sometimes uh, with the coffee uh, or. There is a uh, over, uh, like, uh, overreaction because, like, mm -hmm. if you don't take coffee for a long time, and then you take uh, coffee like uh, first time, and then uh, your body maybe not uh, so maybe overreacting, so like, uh, and. Uh, also the uh, the the action of the caffeine de de depends on the type of the coffee like some of them they have very little caffeine and others can have higher and usually the milk will decrease the uh, 
or concentration that is absorbed. So, mm -hmm. so if you add more milk, then you can decrease the uh, strength of the coffee, so uh, maybe less symptomatic. Mm -hmm. uh, but usually dizziness and uh, headaches and strong headache are not the case. And usually it's vice versa, you, coffee can even treat the headache if the headache is because of the low pressure. Mm. And, I know, I, I usually drink coffee, but uh, it was this one time when I felt these symptoms. So maybe the coffee was uh, over strong, like some, mm -hmm. some coffee like the Vietnamese coffee is very strong. And uh, usually people drink like a large amount of coffee, of like normal coffee, like that is not as strong. And when they sometimes find the strong types of the coffee, then they can drink a lot and that can lead to the overdose. So mm -hmm. usually there, there is about uh, 200 milligrams of the caffeine in every uh, pot of the coffee uh, and the overdose is about 10 cups I think from 10 to 20 cups of the coffee so you need for overdose so that is why usually you cannot drink so much during the day Okay, then um, of which drugs are useful to treat the uh, hypertension setting? Um, there are many classes, there were many classes, there was diuretics. Um, so indeed, uh, there are four main classes. First, one of them is diuretics, okay, then? Um, ACE inhibitor, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is, this is the second one. And I think renin inhibitors. Also, the uh, it's they are all the same, like the uh, renin in inhibitors uh, and the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So, mm -hmm. sorry, not. Uh, and uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. So this, like ACE in inhibitors, uh, uh, recept ACE receptor, angiotensin receptor blockers, and uh, renin inhibitors. So these three are very common, and actually they all are the angiotensin. Uh, and, uh, so and actually the uh, angiotensin is the our strongest uh, substance that is synthesized in the body and regulate the blood pressure. So, like the body has a intrinsic uh, system for regulation of the blood pressure. Mm -hmm. so, and other two like are beta blockers and uh, calcium channel blockers. So these are the four groups that are uh, used to, to main groups, but there are many others, but these are most commonly used uh, groups of drugs for uh, blood, well, increased blood pressure treatment. So usually they are like beta blockers and tenzin converting enzyme inhibitors diuretics and calcium channel block. So these are the four groups. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you know about the pathogenesis of the arterial hypertension? Of Not what? Necessary. Pathogenesis like uh, uh, do you have a pathology? Yes, uh, pathogenesis of, of what? Of the arterial hypertension. Yeah, 
Yes, we we had uh, pathology. So, do you have you studied the uh, pathogenesis of the arterial hypertension? No, I don't think so. No. Okay. No, I don't think so. Why? <laughs> we studied we studied physiology in in the first year. It's not physiology. Yes, physiology, and then pathology this year, but we have not studied hypertension. Oh, so you are not completed yet. Mm -hmm. No, we have an exam in June. Yeah, so, what? Uh, so it's strange because usually it should be the first, I think. Like but we, we studied this uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We studied when we studied um, uh, the, the topic was how was I think blood volume or blood volume. Okay, good. Or, so. or, or water volume, something. I, I don't remember the name okay. of the topic. So, but uh, we started this system. Yeah. So, what do you know about renin angiotensin and aldosterone system? It's like um, a cascade uh, to to increase blood pressure, or I think to increase the. I don't remember. It was water volume. I, I don't remember. Okay, so the renin is uh, synthesized in the uh, kidney, mm -hmm. and so let's start from the beginning. <laughs> okay. So, so the kidney is very sensitive to the blood pressure. So because uh, kidney, the blood goes through the kidney and there is a glomerular filtration so and then filtration will make the uh, primary urine the primary urine goes for reabsorption and then uh, turns to the secondary urine and then goes to the bladder and eventually you feel the uh, uh, urgency to pee and then go to the toilet and pee so this is how our bodies work yes so, the topic was water and electrolyte disorders so that's right so actually it's connected so mm -hmm. the water balance i think yes so and uh the kidneys also can synthesize uh so the kidneys uh, are usually happy when the blood pressure is normal but when the blood pressure is low they feel unhappy because they cannot uh, filtrate the blood to the urine so and then uh, the toxic compounds that should be eliminated from the blood they remain in the blood that is not good that is why when kidney feels that the blood pressure is low, it will uh, synthesize the renin. Renin is an uh, uh, enzyme that will increase uh, the synthesis of the angiotensin converting enzyme, and then angiotensin converting enzyme will uh, uh, synthesize, will convert the angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is a very potent vasoconstrictor. Vasoconstrictor. So, correct. So this, this is the way one of the mech, one of the ways the body will regulate the blood pressure. So when the blood pressure is high, then the kidney will feel that the blood pressure is very high, because uh, they uh, they don't want to damage uh, themselves because the kidneys will feel that. Like uh, when you uh, so, like uh, for example, when you uh, squeeze something through the net, uh, if you push much, then the net can be damaged. So, uh, similarly, here the kidneys uh, uh, 
glomerulus can be damaged because of the high pressure. That is why kidneys will decrease the renin synthesis, that will, de will decrease the angiotensin 2, and that will lead to the uh, reduction in the blood pressure. So this is very fast. fast uh, it's not very fast, but like very strong, uh, strong and powerful system for regulation of the blood pressure. But it's not the only one. Uh, so, uh, and uh, all the factors that influence the blood pressure include the uh, peripheral uh, vessels resistance, like the uh, arterioles uh, that, uh, if so, the uh, size of the arterioles uh, is. Uh, making the pressure the much increase or decrease of the pressure so when the uh, peripheral resistance is high uh, then the pressure will be increased and then the, if the pressure is low so if the resistance is low then the pressure will decrease so resistance here is like when uh, when the water flows through the tiny pipes, then there is a laminar resistance. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the resistance and uh, maybe in on physics. Have you studied that on physics? Yes, but it was uh, in the first year in the first year the yes. more it was useful so you studied it for purpose <laughs> so that is why uh, we should uh, i think i think we also studied in uh, physiology too like laminar flow and uh, turbulent flow yes right right right, right. so mm -hmm. this is the uh, gift to the resistance so and uh like uh, if you have a, a large pipe then the water will flow faster uh, like for example, you need to uh, to uh, to water your uh, your vegetables in your garden. So, do you have a garden? What? Do you have a garden? No. No. Like no. you are in Egypt, and then it's very. Uh, it's very easy to plant like potatoes and uh, other fruits and vegetables so you don't need to go so to buy them to the supermarket so you can plant them on your backyard and then you will eat fresh fruits and vegetables all the year so you should you should make some uh, garden in your backyard so if you want to to water your uh, your future garden with the fruits and vegetables so then you have an option to buy a, a small diameter pipe or a large diameter pipe so if you buy a small diameter pump then uh, the water you you will need more time to water the plants because uh, the water cannot flow fast through the small pipe so small tube so that is why usually the uh, pipes in the garden are large and the larger is the pipe the more water can flow and the faster you so more more water you can deliver per minute to the uh, to your plants So uh, the same here, uh, when the vessels are small, then uh, the, uh, the blood flow is slower and the, the higher is the resistance. So, and that is why the small uh, vessels will give higher resistance and then they will increase the pressure 
more than the large vessels because large vessels they have uh, no resistance at all like our artery and aorta they are large in purpose so they don't have much resistance so the peripheral resistance is the second uh, important uh, factor in the uh, blood pressure development and control so the increasing resistance will increase the blood pressure decreasing resistance will decrease and then the third component is the heart heart rate so actually heart is a, a natural pump and the uh, the higher is the heart rate and the higher will be the blood pressure so and you know that there are a lot of substances that will can increase and decrease our blood pressure and like neurological and the, uh, the hormones like adrenaline so when you see uh, some danger like uh, for example uh, if you see that uh, during the exam if you see if you see that the uh, the examiner will, will notice you are cheating right? then your heart rate will increase because of the you're afraid that you will be punished for the cheating so oh just if you know don't cheat during the exam uh, then when you enter the exam room and you see the examiner then your heart rate increases because you are you're afraid of of the results because you, you want to be uh, to get a, a, a good score or and don't fail the exam uh, so uh, and then your heart rate will increase uh, because your brain will activate the sympath uh, to uh, sympathetic nervous system will be activated uh, and then the adrenaline will be released to the blood and then the heart rate will increase uh, and this also will increase the blood pressure so these are three main components that will influence the blood pressure and there are also many other components uh, but this will uh, increase the blood pressure much uh, so then let's discuss the uh, drugs so uh, we already studied the beta blockers so what do you know about what kind of beta blockers do you know i i don't really remember the names of the drugs so what do you remember what do you remember if you don't remember names, anything you remember, or any, the question is not, not only for the Sandy, for all of you. We started the last semester. Like, do you remember that all beta blockers end with all O? Like, metaprolol, propranolol, atenolol, 
So at the end, there is all O. Yes, I remember. Remember? So this is easy. So if you don't remember the uh, the beta blocker, then say something, then all all. <laughs> <laughs> and then probably uh, you will be right. <laughs> I so, think there was there was one which is called uh, metaprol. Yes, metaprolol is uh, mm -hmm. is the one the most commonly used uh, because metaprolol is selective beta one and is very well researched. Yes. Sorry, and, oh, uh, and um, I I also read that. In the chapter that they cannot be stopped uh, abruptly. Yes, they have to be stopped. That's true for all the antihypertensives, especially beta blockers, because if you stop them abruptly, then the blood pressure will increase and are even higher than it was before starting the meds. So that is why uh, if you want to discontinue or switch the patient from the beta blocker to other uh, drug, then you have to discontinue uh, uh, step by step on decreasing the dose during the one month. So like mm -hmm. uh, first week you decrease dose. Uh, by uh, twice and then next week uh, again twice and etc uh, etc et uh, right. until you are almost not taking anything uh, isn't uh, isn't hypertension a chronic disease yes it is chronic and it is then why why would they stop uh, the the treatment the usually uh, the treatment is not stopped, but uh, usually the, uh, the another drug is used to treat, so the drugs are switched from one uh, group to another group because uh, either uh, it was ineffective uh, or the uh, adverse effects uh, in the effective dose are very high and the patient self cannot tolerate the adverse effects. So these are the main reasons. Uh, there are some special conditions when the, uh, the antihypertensive should be stopped and that is usually pregnancy. So, uh, because all antihypertensives are contraindicated for pregnant women, and especially angiotensin converting enzymes are teratogenic, and that is why they are absolutely contraindicated, and the uh, patient must, you know, so before the pregnancy, the patient must uh, take another antihypertensive. And preferably no anti no medicine at all, but that usually is not the case because the pregnancy itself increases the blood pressure. And if the woman has a high blood pressure before the pregnancy, then she will more likely have even higher uh, uh, blood pressure during the pregnancy, and especially during the del delivery. So that are the most so the, that this is the most common case. And uh, also uh, I think in some underdeveloped countries maybe the shortage of the medicines and that can be reason for the discontinue the medicine so or uh, there is another disease and another drug 
that is on, on that is that will or react with the antihypertensive medicine so if the two drugs are contraindicating together then and the other disease is more severe then uh, the drug can should be stopped too so actually for because of the drug interaction so there are uh, selective beta, beta blockers like selective beta 1 or cardio selective and these are better now so metoprolol and ethanolol are called cardio selective and uh, there is also a propranolol propranolol is the first beta blocker that was discovered and for uh, the person that discovered propranolol received a Nobel prize uh, for the discovery in medicine so the propranolol is uh, non-selective and uh, it acts on beta 1 of the heart and also for beta 2 of the smooth muscles including the uh, bronchioli uh, uterus and the blood of oh, sorry the urinary bladder and uh, so that leads to the uh, increase in the tone of the bronchioli that in normal patients is uh, will not lead to any anything but in asthmatic patients can precipitate the uh, as the asthma uh, attack so that is why the asthmatic patients uh, propranolol is contraindicated Sorry. and that is why uh, the metoprolol is prescribed is most commonly prescribed uh, beta blocker because it is selective uh, and there is also a nebivolol nebivolol is also selected beta blocker and it also increases the nitric oxide production in the endothelium of the vessels and uh, that leads to the additional vasodilation so this is if you remember the nitric oxide is a, a endogenous uh, vasodilating factor uh, that is actually uh, okay is synthesized by the uh, endothelium in the vessels and it is uh, synthesized continuously the uh, non-selective um, beta blockers also are contraindicated in uh, diabetic patients in asthmatic patients uh, and also should be used very carefully in patients with heart acute heart failure or the disease of the vessels so like for example the uh, varicose disease do you know what is varicose I guess no. So you will know by uh, uh, when you start working in pharmacy. Do you know why? Why? <laughs> because it is the professional disease of a pharmacist. Varicose disease. So varicose. Um, veins of the legs
So the thing is, when you start working at pharmacy, you will most time of your work you will stand uh, at the counter, and that is why uh, that increases the uh, the load to your legs. And eventually the vessels of the leg will increase in size and then uh, will uh, have some thrombus and uh, that, that leads to the varicose disease that is very uh, disabling a disease. So So that is why uh, you should uh, keep your legs moving. So like running uh, to the work and from the work uh, or make some physical exercise uh, during the breaks, during the lunch break. So to, uh, to prevent the development of the disease. And it is large uh, problem in uh, at least in our country because most of the pharmacists here are women, and also this disease is uh, um, uh, for women there is a also a cosmetic defect. So because of the legs will look less attractive uh, because of the uh, stars, vein stars on, on them. And uh, some women even will make a surgery to remove the varicose veins so to keep their uh, legs uh, uh, attractive for cosmetic pur uh, purposes. Unfortunately, that is not the treatment for the disease, uh, it only has a cosmetic effect. Uh, so that is why the best treatment for the varicose disease is uh, prevention. I think there are some uh, workouts for varicose veins, no? Uh, there are no special workouts, but any workout uh, that is done regularly uh, is good. So mm -hmm. the reason is like the staying on legs for a long time, uh, stationary, uh, without moving much. So mm -hmm. uh, and usually it is professional disease of the pharmacies, the uh, the retailers, or the surgeons also because surgeon is also during the operation is standing stationary cannot move around <laughs> so so any a non moving or uh, and also uh, they're crossing the legs uh, when sitting pro 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 promotes uh, the development of the disease and that is why it's mostly the so uh, uh, and it is more common in women than in men uh, for some reason so uh, in men it's usually only in uh, in uh, older men like uh, uh, in 60s but women usually, like young women also, are suffering from this disease. Uh, so, the beta blockers uh, will uh, decrease the heart rate, and uh, that is why they are more effective in patients with the heart disease like uh, tachyarrhythmia uh, the uh, previous uh, MI, angina, 
and chronic heart failure. So, uh, uh, so as usually, uh, they are contraindicated in asthmatics. Even the selective metoprolol is contraindicated because uh, it's not recommended because the selectivity is not complete. So these are the recommendations. So do you know? Do you remember the adverse effects? And yes, also the pharmacokinetics uh, is uh, they all are taken orally. Metoprolol is available also available uh, as injectable. And uh, the antihypertensive effect develops during several weeks. So metoprolol and propanolol are available as injectables for fast for emergency hypertension. For the treatment of emergency hypertension. We will talk about emergency hypertension later, that is very high pressure. Do you remember the adverse effects? Um, I think just uh, this abrupt withdrawal that it should not be stopped uh, at once. All right, so, but it's not adverse effects actually. It's, it's mm, maybe a negative part of the drug. Uh, um, it's, it's like the prescription uh, uh, rules, like how to start and stop, mm -hmm. but not adverse effects. So, is are there any adverse effects you remember? Yes, uh, I remember hypertension. Hypertension uh, or or orthostatic hypertension. So or like what? Or orthostatic. Orthostatic mm -hmm. hypertension is the hypotension that is occurs when the body position is changed from uh, lying to standing and from sitting to standing. Test. Like, mm -hmm. have you ever feel dizziness when you stand up fast? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is orthostatic hypotension. And sometimes it's so severe that some old people can even syncope. So they can fall down and lose their consciousness because of the hypotension. Mm -hmm. So the second um, uh, adverse effect is bradycardia and bradycardia like uh, leads also to fatigue so because of the bradycardia that due to beta 1 receptor blockers block in the heart patients can feel fatigue at the end of the day more than they usually feel and then the, so this is the second and third, bradycardia and fatigue. Also, uh, the fourth is insomnia. So insomnia, and the last one, the fifth, is a sexual dysfunction. So do you know what is a sexual dysfunction? Sexual dysfunction. No, it's not. <laughs> clear. I think it's clear. <laughs> what is clear there? Ahmed, <laughs> Ahmed, what is the sexual dysfunction in men? Ahab. Uh, 
so I am asking you because uh, I suppose that everything sexual uh, is not very well discussed in the Muslim communities because of the uh, rel religious uh, uh, education so but when you are a medical student so then you you have to be aware so that actually there are two uh, sexual dysfunctions do you know which and why <coughs> no so because uh, uh so sexual intercourse is usually between two people men and women and then that is why sexual dysfunction also has uh, differences in men and women. So in men, sexual dysfunction is the loss of erection. So uh, the men cannot uh, erect. Uh, so and uh, in uh, women, uh, the sexual dysfunction is decrease in libido. So there is a hub. So, what is the sexual dysfunction in men? I don't know. I, I just thought it. Do you listen <laughs> carefully? So, uh, it is uh, loss of erection is the sexual dysfunction in men and uh, decrease in libido in women. So, in men, it is uh, inability to erect the penis. And then in women, it is decreased, uh, uh, decreased the uh, the attractiveness to the men. So it is libido, like the uh, uh, that actually will both of these will. No, uh, will uh, usually lead to less uh, intercourses between the species. So, and uh, usually men are, are complaining uh, more about this side effect than women. So, because uh, women they have a menstrual cycle and during so they don't have a uh, frequent uh, libido, so libido is usually uh, low uh, during the most of the days of the cycle. So if yeah, like there are only uh, seven to ten days when libido is high in during the menstrual cycle. So, but in men actually they don't have menstrual cycle, so that is why. Uh, they feel the adverse effects every day so that is why they usually report more frequently so the reason for this is unknown by the way so because the uh, beta blockers the beta receptors are not directly participating in the libido or the uh, erection of the piece so about this sexual dysfunction is very frequently reported So, because fatigue is actually uh, can be from the work also, that is why bradycardia, the, the patients are not feeling bradycardia. Uh, arterial hypotension can be easily uh, uh, removed just by way, uh, standing up slowly. So, and insomnia is usually treated by the recreational drugs. So, or the, uh, the sleeping tablets. So, uh, so these are the adverse effects. So then, let's move to the next group is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So, uh, do you know? Uh, what and what uh, what drugs do you know from this group? Uh, 
I don't remember names of, uh, of the drugs. So uh, the the most commonly used drug is enalapril and captopril. And uh, these drugs are taken orally. So uh, the uh, and these drugs are pro drugs. So uh, the captopril and uh, lisinopril are the uh, drugs that will convert it uh, to the active drugs in the uh, liver. Uh, So all drugs are available orally as tablet and an lot is also available intravenously. But it's, it is very strong, that is why it should be used very carefully. So the uh, adverse effects include the dry cough. The most commonly reported adverse effect is dry cough and also there may be uh, orthostatic hypotension. By the way, orthostatic hypotension is the universal adverse effect for all antihypertensive drugs. Then also the hyperkalemia and the skin dash are other adverse effects. So the dry cough is very commonly seen in patients and uh, the most of the old patients, the elderly patients will uh, discontinue the drug because of the dry cough. It's supposed that uh, the uh, angiotensin receptor blockers are uh, like uh, lisinopril uh, uh, no, so, sorry, uh, like uh, Lazartan and uh, Balsartan are less uh, causing the less uh, dry cough and uh, that is why it may be used as an alternative for these patients. Then also there is a renin inhibitor that is aliskiren and uh, Ariskiren has almost the same effects and uh, the same adverse effects and the same. It's very similar to the uh, angiotensin converting enzymes and angiotensin to receptor blockers. And then there is also a calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers are, are uh, usually used in patients uh, with uh, asthma. asthma and uh, the diabetes. So uh, about the disadvantage of the uh, calcium channel blockers, that actually three of them are used, nifedipine, uh, verapamil and diltazem. And the, the disadvantage of calcium channel blockers is the non-selectiveness and they decrease the uh, tone of the all muscles Sorry. and they are eventually will cause the tiredness and weakness in the muscles and that is why and also they will cause dizziness uh, because of the uh, or low pressure and headaches also and also edema the edema of the hands and legs feet also so are the most common adverse effects so uh, 
and um, also there are drugs for hypertensive emergency and hypertensive emergency is the uh, cis, uh, is a very high pressure uh, 180 cis, uh, systolic higher than 180 systolic and a higher than 120 diastolic and this is usually during the myocardial in infection MI and uh, the reason was, and the patient should uh, decrease the uh, the blood pressure fast because long uh, long increase such large increase and during long time can lead to the damage of the kidneys so and kidneys kidneys will not be happy like uh, it's like uh, oh, it's like when you feel the uh, urgency for urinating then if you don't go to the uh, to the toilet what happens The kidneys start to hurt. No, it's not about kidney. This is about the uh, urinary bladder. So, do you feel something when you have to pee, but you you don't have toilet nearby? What do you feel? Pain, like? Um, yes. Pain. So. Uh, and then uh, eventually if you don't find the place to pee then maybe uh, uh, the, uh, the eventually the uh, may, the, the bladder will self urinate so that is commonly seen in children uh, in children the, they can uh, uh, in young, so in baby children, uh, they can urinate during the uh, sleep. So this is, uh, and uh, the same uh, principle is here when the blood pressure is high, then uh, the kidney can be damaged by the blood, and then we will see a blood in the kidney, and this is the uh, non reversal so like the damage of the kidney is permanent and that is why it is very important to uh, decrease the blood pressure as fast as possible before the damage occurs to the kidney and also damage will lead damage to the intima of the vessels because vessels can, are damaged by the high blood pressure too so uh, there are many medicines available and usually the uh, calcium channel blockers are used like the intravenous, all drugs are intravenous like nicardipine is available on intravenous and then the most potent drug that is available intravenously is sodium nitroprusate and uh, sodium nitroprusate is uh, I think you studied it on chemistry, right? What, what is it again? Sodium nitroprusate. So it is the uh, nitric oxide donator that will, on uh, when dissolved in the blood, it will release the um, nitric oxide in large amounts. So and uh, it is should be used very carefully because it can lead to the syncope so because it will decrease the blood pressure like a hair and also uh, the uh, alpha receptor blockers like phentolamine uh, and labitalol are used 
and also he hide the lazy uh, and dopamine uh, agonist phenyl dopam so the most uh, I think the most useful is phenyl dopam because it uh, re relatively uh, uh, safe and effective and the duration of action is longer than all of the above mentioned uh, and also if the patient has a kidney disease already or have any other disease of the heart then uh, the uh, even lower pressures can be treated as emergency so uh, then actually uh, in all the patients like 160 is already emergency can be already an emergency so so for the emergency there are no oral drugs uh, though some patients use captopril uh, sublingually that is not correct and should not be used so this I think that is all for today and uh, we have a lecture after this so do you want the, the lecture after the lunch time or um, maybe maybe we can start earlier so we can finish earlier so when do you want to start 